What remains a mystery still to this day is the absence of a consensus among historians and archaeologists about what causes the decline and eventual extinction of so many civilizations. But it's not really a mystery. When you do a comparative analysis of the ancient and classical and even some modern civilizations, you arrive at a general conclusion. The common theme is this. The rents, the sacred rents which were originally invested to create those civilizations in the first place, to fund the infrastructure that made them possible, at some point some people start to privatize those rents and those rents start to get diverted to personal use for the self-aggrandizement of a few individuals instead of being invested for the common good. When that happens, the energy starts to ebb away from the civilization. The vitality, the creativity that any expanding urban civilization needs is dissipated and the governments have to start taxing people which then suppresses the productive capacity of the population. You put those two things together, the privatization of the sacred rents and taxing people's labors and you have a recipe for catastrophe. It's that which is the common theme that leads to the eventual collapse of civilization. Civilization became possible because people voluntarily agreed to pool the net income, the sacred income, the sacred rents for the common good. In doing so, they created two kinds of new power, new in the history of the human species. The first kind of power was the hard power made possible by investing resources in the waterways that made the cities like Babylon possible in the Near East, in their arid zones. The amphitheatres for which classical Greece is famous, the highways of ancient Rome. In addition though, there was the soft power. The sacred income made it possible to enhance the spiritual experience, to build the temples where people could gather, to provide the time for people like Socrates to philosophize, for people to devote time, investing time, not to producing the food they needed for their daily bread, but to experiment in what became science. This soft power, when merged with the hard power, created sustainable civilization. Civilization flourished for so long as the sacred revenue, the sacred rents, was pooled for the common good. But once those sacred rents began to be privatized, that became the beginning of the end of civilization. Scaffolding is used to support the columns of ancient temples like this a sacred monument to one of the Greek gods. But isn't our civilization also being held up by scaffolding? We call it quantitative easing. That's the reckless, desperate expansion of the money supply, pouring money into the economy, trying to keep it afloat. Keeping afloat an economy that is unsustainable. At a conference on the Greek island of Rhodes, I explained how tax reform could renew our globalized civilization. What we're looking for is organic growth out of the present realities to something that ends up being a new paradigm, a new model. We're hearing a lot from even the highest uh, international financial institutions now that the existing system simply doesn't work. And what they're saying is they don't know what to do next. When the next crisis hits, all they can do is keep going with the existing arrangements which they know, which they've confessed, does not work. So how do we organically shift from the current paralysis to what would, in the end, be a new model, a new paradigm, a new social system that actually solves our problems
comprehensively. What I'm suggesting is that if we alter the financial system in the, by rebalancing the way the government funds its obligations by s progressively reducing the taxes on wages and uh, raising the revenue in a neutral way so there's no cut in, in income, no reduction in public spending, no austerity in other words, rebalancing the public uh, revenue system, shifting onto the rents of land. Why? Why the rents of land? In the United Kingdom, the taxes that we employ impose what the economist calls excess burdens. What does that mean? It, the, the more attractive, more precise phrase is deadweight losses. In Britain today, if we raise all the revenue via the government, collecting it from an annual ground rent, that was uh, Adam Smith's concept, an annual ground rent. If we raised it in that way, rather than taxing people's wages, taxing entrepreneurial profits, and all the other taxes which burden the economy, the British economy would be larger today by something like 500 billion pounds. Across Europe, the VAT has a similar effect of suppressing economic activity. If, if the European Union eliminated the VAT and raised the revenue instead with an annual ground rent charge, the, the European economy would be larger by about one trillion euros. The government doesn't have to do anything to generate that extra revenue of wealth and welfare, just rebalance the way it raises its revenue, reduce the burden on, the, on people who go to work, and draw the revenue from the one source that could, uh, inflicts no distortions on the economy. That is one of the bedrock principles in classical economics, which everybody all the way up to Stiglitz today confirm would not distort the economy. The consequence of that would be heading towards the new paradigm. In this first slide, I'm suggesting that by the government interfering in no way other than shifting the structure of its revenue, wonderful things would begin to happen. First of all, governance itself would be accountable to the people. We blame the market, but the rules are set by government, so we have state-sponsored unemployment. We need to put the blame where it actually belongs. If anybody's exploiting the present system, they're doing it, yes, they may be greedy, sharks and whatever, but the laws allow them to do it, right? And we, if we are a democracy, are under an obligation to change the rules. The capital markets, they are distorted as well. People don't invest their capital to generate the best results for the consumers. They look at what is a tax-efficient investment. This is not market failure. They, people are acting rationally when they say we will invest on the basis of tax efficient decisions. We want to maximize our profits. You can't blame entrepreneurs for saying that if the rules of the game allow them to do it. But it's our responsibility to, to, responsibility to change the rules of the game. And we can. The economics and the ethics of this are perfect. They deliver harmony in the uh, uh, economy, in the relationship between people, in their civic uh, lives, in their economic activities and in their political activities. But what happens very quickly with confronting uh, governments today with the need for this kind of change? Unfortunately, this is where we hit what is actually the biggest problem. And we need to recognize that it's the biggest problem if we're actually going to progress this idea. And I'll give you three historical examples very quickly. Louis XVI in France in the 18th century. And unfortunately, the peasants were getting restless. The people in the town were getting restless. Turgo, who was the finance minister, went to the king and said, look, what we must do is change the tax regime. We must rebalance things. We shouldn't penalize people who are working, raise the revenue from the rent of land. No, said Louis, 
Louis and his queen had a meeting with Madame Guillotine, end of the Ancien Regime. Second example, late 19th century, Russia. The peasants were getting restless, so were the people in the towns. A man called Leo Tolstoy, who owned a large estate, who was close to the peasants, he recognized that there was a problem emerging within Russia. So he submitted long documentation to the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II, and said, look, what we need to do in Russia in order to progress our society is change the tax system, raise more revenue from the rent of land, reduce the burden on the peasants. No, said Nick, uh, Nicholas II. He and his family ended up in a basement and Lenin's revolutionaries with their pistols shot them. Third example, China. The emperor at the beginning of the 20th century was a young man, he was well educated. Around China at the time was a man called Sun Yat-sen who was going around saying what we need to do because we have to change the system in China. What we need is, and he called it the three principles of the people. And one of the principles was we must rebalance the revenue system. We must raise revenue from land and get the burden on the peasants down. No. Nope. In 1911, the last of the Qing dynasty was out and the Republic was born. So there you have examples where people in power can be told what is good for their society that would rescue them, prevent them from having their uh, necks severed from their uh, heads from their bodies, but they couldn't do it. Time and again, the decision makers would not make the change that was rational. So, when we think about the uh, European uh, economy today, or what's going on in Washington, don't imagine that because this is a rational, correct way to evolve organically into a new paradigm, that it will actually happen. Because there are great resistances, because the power ultimately in our society is with those who control the rent. And somehow we have to find a way to make it possible for it in a democracy for the people to reclaim the right to determine how their revenue is raised.